Open your Bible to the book of John. The book of John, the gospel of John. And if you're trying to find that, it's in the New Testament. Fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in chapter 10 and verse 10. John chapter 10 and verse 10. And this morning I'm going to begin something that I'm going to continue for a few weeks at least um, called enjoying life. Enjoying life. And I believe that there's some wonderful keys uh, that the Bible teaches us in enjoying life. And I believe if we line up with those, we can live life filled with joy. How many of you like to live life filled with joy? Uh, you can do it. John 10 and verse 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And this is Jesus talking. It says, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. This is a pretty important understanding that you need to have concerning God and the thief or what we'd call the devil or the enemy or Satan. We need to have a good understanding here that, that Jesus is saying that the thief or the devil, Satan, the enemy, he's the one that comes to steal kill and destroy. It's always important to remember that uh, when, when you're watching the news or you're seeing what's going on in life and what's going on, to remember who's the one that's stealing, killing, and destroying or is influencing people to do something like that. It's not God doing that. The enemy does that. The devil does it. God didn't have his hand in what went on in Boston this past week. God wasn't the one causing the pain. God's the one that brings help, restoration, healing. And I believe he's doing that today, even today, right now in Boston, in churches and in families all around that area and all around the country today. Amen. So it's important that you understand that Jesus is making it very clear. He says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The Amplified Bible says it this way. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, destroy. But, but I came that they may have and enjoy life. Everybody say enjoy life. How many of y'all enjoying life right now? I know, I know it's hard to get much better than just right now listening to me preach, but, but it can get better. That I may ha have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I love that translation of that, that, that verse. The Message Bible says it this way, and I like it as well. It says, a thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better than they ever dreamed of. Boy, isn't that good? I came so that they can have real and eternal life more and better life than they ever dreamed of. That's really good news. Now, apparently God wants you, Jesus wants you to not only have life, but to enjoy life and not just enjoy any kind of life, but enjoy real life. Well, what is he talking about when he's talking about real life? Well, the Greek word is the word zoe, and it literally means the life of God the life of God, and it means uh, superabundant in quantity and superior in quality. Superabundant in quantity or superior in quality. It doesn't just mean living life a long time, even though I believe God wants you to live a long time here on the earth. It really is talking about having the quality of life that God has himself and you receiving that and enjoying it for a long time as well. Right, And it's really talking about more than just enjoying it here on the earth. He's really talking about enjoying the life of God for eternity. Yes. Well, the good news is this, though. You don't have to wait till you die and go to heaven to start enjoying. You can start enjoying that life now. Amen. Now, if you've made a confession of Jesus as the Lord of your life, confess your sin, believe on him that he died, and that he rose again on the third day, then you've been what we call born again. You've been made new on the inside. And when you become new on the inside, the life of God is imparted to your spirit. The life of God is imparted to your heart. So again, I know I saw a lot of hands that said you've already confessed that. How many of y'all have confessed that? Believe that, right? That means that you have the life of God, the Zoe, God kind of life, super abundant, hallelujah, in quantity and in quality. I mean, it's really, really good. So the Message Bible says that he wants you to what? To enjoy this life, right? To enjoy this life, to have it for real, to just, just, just be better than anything you ever dreamed of. 
better than anything you ever dreamed. And I like that because sometimes people think serving the Lord or uh, living a life as a Christian is a drag. You know what I mean? Like, well, you know, I've got to go out and have fun before I commit my life to Jesus because after I commit my life to Jesus, it's just no more fun. I've got to go out and sow my, what we call wild oats or whatever. I got to go out and sow my wild oats and really have a good time. I want to experience as much as possible in this world, right? I want to get drunk at least once. So, you know, I want to smoke something really good once. I want to go to a couple really good parts. I really want to live it up for a few years of my life, right? So that when I finally commit my life to Christ, and I at least I had fun for a little bit of my life. And people got it all mixed up. I don't know if they, what church they've been going to or the Jesus they've met or what kind of experience they've had with the presence of God and who misrepresented that to them. But for me, there's nothing better than serving Jesus, right? There's nothing better than, than living the life that he's called you to live. There's nothing greater than enjoying him. In fact, when I was a kid, I mean, I gave my life to Christ. I mean, just as a small kid, I don't even really remember. I just remember always loving Jesus, serving Jesus. And I remember being in high school and people telling me about all the crazy things that they were doing. And it sounded absolutely horrible to me. I mean, things like, you know, man, we had such a great time this weekend. You know, we partied so hard. And then I threw up in the toilet and then I woke up and I didn't know where I was at or who I'd slept with, man. It was awesome. And I'm thinking, that sounds horrible to me. First of all, I don't like throwing up. I don't like putting my face somewhere where my behind is supposed to be. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Right? I don't, I don't want to like sleep around with people and not sure if I have babies all over the place that don't even know about it. I don't know if I caught something or they caught something. or I don't know if I'm in Vegas or Florida or Alexandria. I don't know what happened, right? I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live like that. I've already got the life that I'm looking for. I've already got, in fact, what you're looking for. And I think sometimes people, when they're talking about surrendering their life to Christ, they, they really mean, I'm going to calm down, get a good job, and go to church on Sundays. You know what I mean? They think that's what living for Christ is like. That's, that means I'm a Christian now because I don't go crazy, you know, anymore. And because I don't do stupid stuff anymore. And I can get drunk no more. You know, I, I'm a good person. And that's not really what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't just trying to save you from just being like a bad person and like just getting drunk every now and then. Jesus was wanting to revolutionize your very existence. I mean, just give you something you never had before. I mean, you thought you were really living when you were out there doing whatever you were doing in the world. You really thought you was getting it all, and you really thought you was having a great time. And then now, man, when you receive Jesus, all of a sudden you realize that everything that this world has to offer is just like, it's just like a haze compared to the reality of the life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Right? Isn't it so much bigger, anybody can t testify to this, isn't it so much bigger than just, you know, joining a church? Come on, isn't it so much bigger than just saying I'm a good person? Isn't it so much bigger? Than, I mean, it's a total change of living. It's a to total change of existence. It's like there was nothing on the inside and you're trying to shove stuff in to try to make it fill up that void. But now you found what you were looking for and it says that it's a super abundant, exceeding life that now you got something going on on the inside that just pops out all over the place. Hallelujah. I should have stretched before church this morning. <laughs> super abundant, super abundant in quantity and superior in quality. You know, my dad used to tell the story when he was, uh, when he was a kid, about when he was a kid growing up in church. And um, I don't know what his thinking was. And I have, you know, I have an idea that a lot of teenagers kind of have this kind of thought or young people, you know. Um, you know, if I surrender to God, he's going to make me do something that I hate for the rest of my life. If I surrender to him, he's really going to make, now if you come to this church very long, you probably haven't heard that too much. Uh, uh, hopefully not at all. But, but sometimes that's kind of the perception. Like, you know, uh, if I surrender to God, then he's going to make me do something that I don't want to do. And I'm going to hate living, you know, but at least I'm going to heaven. I mean, I'd rather hate living and go to heaven than go to hell, I guess. 
So I guess God barely wins out. That's why they try to sow so many wild oats. Have a little bit of fun in life. So my dad said, you know, he thought that if you surrendered to God, there was this girl that was on the praise and worship team. There was a girl that was on the praise and worship team and her name was Charlotte. Forgive me if your name is Charlotte today. It's a beautiful name. They have movies named after that. I mean, that name, it's amazing. Yeah, anyway, don't think about that. So he thought that, that this girl named Charlotte, he thought that if he surrendered to God, that God was going to make him marry Charlotte. And in his mind, he thought, I would rather go to hell than marry Charlotte. <laughs> now, that, that's just what his thinking was. But a lot of people have funny thoughts like that. Like if I surrender to God, you know, it's just, just, just life's going to be horrible. So I've really got to make a point to enjoy it before I surrender to him or it's just going to get worse. Now, if you've surrendered your life to Christ and you've been serving him, then you realize, anybody here can testify to the fact that you realize that living life for Christ is the best life that there is to live. The most peace, the most joy, the most excitement, the most fun, the most good. I mean, I mean, just nothing better than, li than living the life that we are to live in Christ Jesus. Apparently, to me, too, it sounds like he wants you to enjoy it. I mean, Jesus didn't go die on the cross, pay the price for your sin, and raise again on the third day just so you could just have a pathetic existence in life. It's like, I'm going to give you the very life that God has it, but you're not really going to like it that much, right? I'm going to give you the very life as, as God has it, but it's not really going to change you very much. I mean, you know, you're just going to want to, you know, do right a little bit more than the bad. No, it just changes everything about you. Now in Psalm 1611, you can turn there real quick. I want you to see it. Psalm 16, 11, it says this, it says, you will show me the path of life. You will show me the path of life and in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You will show me what? The path of life, the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. Now I want you to see just that first part there. He says, you'll show me the path of of life. Now that word life, and you know the, the Old Testament is primarily written in Hebrew, all right? And that, that word means to, to live or to come alive. To live or to come alive. He says, so you're going to show me, God, you're going to show me the path of living or how I come alive in what you've called me to do, right? Now that same word is, is, is the same word that was used in Genesis 2 and verse 7, all right? And if you know anything about Genesis, it talks about Adam, all right? Adam and Adam was created and it says that the Lord uh, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, talking about God breathing into Adam, all right, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the same word there, the breath of life and man became a living, another, again, same word, a living being. So when God breathed into him, Adam became alive with God's life. He became alive with God's life. Now in Psalm 16, 11, it's the same thing. He says, you'll show me the path of life. You'll show me the path, the way to live the life that you've called me to live. The life that you've called me to give. Then what does it go on to say? He says, and in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. That word fullness means a satisfaction. A satisfaction of joy. Exceeding, exceeding joy. Exceeding joy. One of the meanings of that word joy is just lightheartedness. Now that sounds kind of funny, but it just means that nothing really gets to you because nothing really compares to the joy that you found in him. Amen. You've been made complete in his presence and in his presence, you are now satisfied with the joy that he has given you. One of the words means this as well, glee. Glee, just like, you know what I mean? Almost just like a, a happy all the time. 
a, a happy all the time. So what is he saying? He says, you'll show me the path of life. And when I find the path of life that I find in you and what you've called me to do, where you've called me, all that. He says, when I find that in you, he says, and I get in your presence, there is a satisfaction that I find in your presence, that I find in your life that I can't find in anything else or in anyone else or in doing anything else. I find that in you. I find that in you, in his presence. There's a satisfaction of your joy. There's a satisfaction. That means, man, you have just been filled to the full with him. Filled to the full of him. You know, if we would live aware of the life of God that we have on the inside of us, and if we would live aware of the presence of God in our life, we would live life more full of joy. Joyful. You know, the Bible says that Abraham walked with God. Or no, it says Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was the friend of God. He talked. Abraham was a friend of God. Think about that. A friend of God. Abraham, friend of God. I mean, you're talking to each other. Talking to each other. Well, that's a pretty amazing thing to be called the friend of God, isn't it? Well, Scripture teaches us that because of Jesus, we're now children of God. Sons and daughters of God. That means we can have fellowship, communion, and talk to him all the time. Fellowship, I think sometimes we put God in this, there goes my little mint, all right. Um, sometimes we put God in this little, this little box like, God, you have, you know, an hour and a half on Sunday morning, all right? And after that hour and a half, you know, I'll check back in next Sunday. And when I check back in next Sunday, you got another hour and a half. But then after that hour and a half, then I'll check back in with you the next Sunday, unless I'm doing something else more important. Um, yeah. <laughs> just messing with y'all. All right, so you get my point, though. We got God in this little box like, you know, I'm going to enjoy your presence when April hits the high note. <laughs> That's our praise and worship leader. It was just singing, right? I, I'm going to enjoy your presence when they really sing really good for about 20 minutes. I'm really going to enjoy it. But after that, you know, that's about all I got. No, but even before Jesus came, it says that Abraham was a friend of God, talked with God. And as children, as children of God, then we can live ever aware of his presence that is in our life because of what Jesus has done. Jesus made a, a way for us to actually come into his presence. That's, that's a, an amazing thing right there. That's an amazing thing right there. So then we are to value and to make room and to be aware of God's presence in our life. And as we are aware of his presence and his life that is on the inside of us, then we can enjoy the life that he has given us. Amen. We can enjoy the life that he's given us. In fact, it's really impossible to enjoy life unless you are living life in Christ. Amen. I mean, you may have moments where you are enjoying aspects of life in the sense of, you know, you got some highs and some lows and maybe, you know, your wedding day and your children, you're enjoying aspects of just, you know, God putting us here on the earth and enjoying uh, uh, relating to one another, things like that. But you're never truly getting the full depth and meaning of life until you're enjoying life that Jesus has given you through himself. You'll always be saying to yourself, this is great, but there's got to be something more than this. Got to be something more than this. I was hearing, I heard someone talk about an interview that they saw with Tom Brady. Anybody ever heard of Tom Brady? He's quarterback uh, for the New England Patriots, won, I don't know, three or four Super Bowls. Anybody know? Something like that, at least three, I think. Um, won about three Super Bowls, MVP and all that stuff. And um, he was being interviewed, um, not by a Christian interviewer, by just somebody. And he was telling them, he said, you know, I, I've... I've won the Super Bowl, and if you know anything about his life, he's married to a, a supermodel. He's got all the money. He's got the most beautiful woman that, you know, everybody else would want, it, you know, if they were looking for somebody, you know, that sort of thing. He's just got everything just lined up just right in his life, right? And he told this interviewer, he says, you know, you would think that, that I would just be really happy. He said, but it just seems like, he said, after I won that last Super Bowl, it just seems like there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. 
So then, sometimes we think I'm going to enjoy life when I reach this pinnacle of life. And then I'm really going to enjoy it when, in fact, you're really missing out on the very life that he gave you or wants you to exist in unless you choose him. And when you choose him, then you realize that even if you won the Super Bowl, it's just a trophy, y'all. I mean, it's just a trophy. They may write your name in the record books. They may do all that. Whatever, if you become a CEO of the business that you've always wanted, there'll be a satisfaction there. But if you're not living for Jesus, then there'll always be something missing. Like, if I could just make another million dollars, if I could just move into a nicer house, if I could just, you know, go on that vacation I've always dreamed about, if I could just go on an Alaskan cruise, if I could just go to Hawaii, if I could just get, you know, 30 days vacation at my job, you know, we just think about, I'm really going to enjoy life when I get to this place. When in fact, if you have Jesus or when you meet Jesus, there's a satisfaction of joy that comes in your heart that even when the storms of life come, even when difficulties come, even when challenge comes in your life and you don't have 30 days vacation, you're not on an Alaskan cruise and you didn't just win the Super Bowl and you're not the CEO, yet you still have joy beyond somebody else who has everything going for them. How is that? I'm enjoying the life I have in Christ. Instead of living like there's always something missing, you can live life like I've already found what I'm looking for. What a difference enjoying life is when Jesus is at the center of it, in his presence. There is fullness of joy in his presence, in his presence. You know, in fact, Moses said it in the book of Exodus. He he told the Lord, he said, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with me, um, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. The value that he placed on the presence of God. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ was ever aware of the presence of God of his father and the Holy Spirit in his life. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Well, in the book of Mark, it says something really interesting. You want to turn there, you can. In the book of Mark, chapter 15, it says this, verse 34. Mark chapter 15 Jesus is on the cross at this point. It's on the cross. In verse 34, it says, And at, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Again, he's on the cross, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, this is what he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? forsaken me. Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge of sour wine, uh, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink saying, uh, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take care, take him down. Verse 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last breath. Then the veil of the temple, I notice that, was, was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Truly this man was the son of God. Now you probably have read that or seen that or heard that many times in your life if if you're a Christian. But just check this one more time. He says, ninth hour, he cried out and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? This had to be the first time in all of existence that he had ever felt absent of the presence of God, of his father. Right? Ever. You have forsaken me. Well, how is that possible that God would do such a thing? The father God would do such a thing. Well, if you know what's happening right here, Jesus is taking upon him the sin of us all. He's taking upon him the sin of us all 
And so Jesus is being forsaken because we should be forsaken by his presence. Now notice what happens just right after that. It says that the veil was torn from top to bottom. Now what does that represent? Well, the veil, it really was saying this, you know, if if, if it was just us in here, really, if I'm the holiest one in here, I, back in Old Testament, I'd be the only one to go into the very presence of God. All the rest of y'all, I'm talking to God and I'm taking care of business for y'all. Y'all can't get in there, all right? But it'd be like if there's a veil, I'm the only one in here, right? There's a veil right here. It says that veil's torn from top to bottom, boom, right here. And what is that representing? What does that represent? It represents God making a way for all of us to step in to the very presence of God or what you call the holy of holies, to step right into this place, to live, dwell in his presence. What an amazing thing that Jesus felt forsaken the same way that every human being feels forsaken without him. Lost, hungry, thirsty for fellowship, for something real, real life, something. And Jesus made a way for you and I to come through that veil, through what he has done for us in his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the shedding of his blood. So now, this is an amazing thing, y'all. Now, you and I don't have to live life forsaken. We don't have to live life absent of the presence of God. We don't have to live life searching and trying to make a way and even trying to earn our, our way to be good enough to where, man, I could just go to church and just feel like I'm a good person because I did right all week. When, when in fact, listen, Jesus was right enough for you and he took all of your unright on him so that you could take all of his right on you so that you can come right into the very presence of God. And now you can be loved, accepted by the presence of God in your life as, as Jesus is. What an amazing thing. Now in the book of Genesis, uh, you know, the scripture says that after Adam and Eve, after they had sinned, and, um, you know, uh, the, Lord, the Lord told them, look, you can just enjoy life. You can do whatever. Just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that. And so then when they did, and I'm not going to go through all that, but, but when they did, they were aware, uh, first of all, that they were naked. I mean, sin came into the earth because of that. They missed it. They sinned. They, they stepped over the line. They stepped over the line. And it said that God came down in the cool of the day, <laughs> calling for them, calling for them. Now, apparently this is probably something that happened on a regular basis, talking with God. If there's no sin, there's no barrier between God and man. Nothing holding you back from being able to enter in, nothing. So Adam, I mean, he's having just wide open, perfect fellowship, communion with God Almighty in the, just walking through the garden in the cool of the day. Uh, Naked, <laughs> side note, but still, uh, no shame whatsoever, nothing to be ashamed of. Hmm. All right, so anyway, some of y'all just woke up. You're like, naked. Did you? <laughs> Pastor Aaron just say naked? He said naked. Yeah. So they go and they, you know, they clothe themselves, and God's looking for them. He says, you know, you know, where, where are you at, Adam? Where are you at, Adam? And this is, this, is what, this is what Adam says. I want to read this to you. It says, when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, it says, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. What did they hide themselves from? What did they hide themselves? Think about it. They hid themselves from from the presence of God. When sin came, the presence of God came, they're like, oh no, 
we, we don't deserve to be in that place. We don't deserve to walk with you. We don't have a way to walk with you. Now they're hiding themselves. Of course, God, he knows everything. He continues to talk to them. Who told you you were naked? You know, what, what's going on here? You know, he knows everything anyway. And so from beginning to the end of what Jesus has done, Adam all the way to Jesus, because of what Adam did, there was separation between God and man. Because of what Jesus did, he undid everything that Adam did. And now we can come into his presence, holy, right, clean, pure. Not based upon because you hadn't cussed your whole life or never told a lie, but because of what Jesus did. He took all of your junk on him and made a way for you to be right with God, which now you can live life aware of the presence of God. Amen. Now you can truly live and enjoy life. Yes. Amen. You can truly live and enjoy life. There's a man by the name of Enoch. Have you ever heard, heard of Enoch? Said that he, he walked with God. I wish I could, well, I have it right here. Says that uh, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. <laughs> That's a long time. He walked with God for 300 years. He had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And it says that Enoch walked with God and, and, was, and he was not, for God took him. What does that mean? I mean, it'd be like walking with God and then just walking straight up into heaven. You know what I mean? Like walking with God, walking really close with God, walking really close with God, and then why? I told you I should have stretched before church. Straight up. With God. Talk about living life in the presence of God and aware of Him. I like something, you know, uh, one minister said it this way. He says, Every time I wake up in the morning, I say, Good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I'm the first thing I do in the morning, same type of thing. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. Mercy. What, what am I doing? Right, the first thing, I'm becoming aware of God and his presence. In my, that may sound really simple, but it puts a smile on my face every morning. Why? Woo. So glad I get to live in your presence, God. So glad I get to be like one of your kids. You know, my kids, you know, first, first thing in the morning, you know, they usually come to our bedroom, usually. Come to our bedroom. We, had, we were gone for a couple days, so Saturday we were home, and they, all three of them ended up in our bed on Saturday, Saturday morning. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> we hadn't seen it for a few days, so it was a blessing. Hallelujah. Glad they didn't do it today, though. But, I mean, all three of them, and we got a king-size bed, so we're just all just, we're all, you know, you know, you're in there, you got your arms in different places, and you're just, you know, really enjoying the morning, y'all. <laughs> really enjoying the morning. That we're, we're just enjoying the fellowship, enjoying being with one another. Every single one of them that I, that I could reach, you know, I wrap my arms around them, talk to them, kiss them, tell them I love them, right? Just letting them know, man, I love you. And, and they, don't have, uh, they don't have any reason to not be able to come in and just talk to me. Not be just able to, you know, even when we're at church here and we've got things going on here at the church and I may be in a meeting, you know, really serious. Remember I've been in serious meetings, you know, I'm in a serious meeting. We're taking care of serious stuff. My kids can do to just run right in there, bust in there, boom, 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 you know, shoes untied and, you know, and a, something in his hand and he's pants are dirty and he's just been outside playing in the, you know, the playground or something. He runs in, he's got his school bag, throws it on the couch, you know, and just walks in. And, I, and part of me wants to be like, boy. <laughs> but another part of me wants to be like, I don't want him to ever think twice about coming into my office. I want him to know he can come in here and your daddy's going to stop. He's going to hug you, kiss you, tell you, tell you that, that he loves you. And you're welcome in my presence. You can come talk to me. Tell, tell me what happened today. It may be the goofiest stuff. I may not even be able to understand everything that he's saying. I, but it don't matter to me. 
I'm just glad that he's in my presence. I want him to live like that as long as I'm alive on this earth and he's alive on this earth. Anytime. Anytime. What is that? He's aware he can come into my presence at any time. Now, I'm not God, so I'm not with him all the time. But God, the Bible says he's omnipresent. That means he can be and is at all places at the same time. What an amazing thing that God can be in our church today and in church across town, across the street, and in church across the country, uh, church across uh, the world at the same time. God's presence can be there. How can God do that? I don't know. He's God. He does it, though. Because I was at a different church last week, and God was there, too. I'm pretty sure he was here. Wasn't he here last week? I mean, he was there last week and here last week. How did he do that? Omnipresent, his presence, his presence was there. You know, when you leave this place, you know, uh, uh, God goes with you. Get in your car, he's with you. Go home, he's with you. Go to work, he's with you. You can talk and fellowship with God every hour of the day. You could wake up in the middle of the night while everybody else is sleeping and God's not. He'll talk to you. You can fellowship with him. Now, that's enjoying life. Why? Because enjoying life begins with the life that he is and the life that he gives. Any other way is just out of order. It's just out of order. So David said something very interesting in Psalm 51. He said, Lord, don't take your presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And if you know anything about David, we know that he was a man after God's own heart. He was a king of Israel. It's a man after God's own heart, but, but yet he sinned. He missed it. He, in fact, you know, he saw Bathsheba taking a bath. How appropriate is that? Bathsheba, bath. I don't know if the Lord named her after the bath or before the bath. I don't know. But... <laughs> Ironic, you know, some things in the Bible. You're like, that's just interesting. He liked what he saw. He called her over. And I mean, long story short, I mean, he just did the wrong thing like three or four times in a row in the same situation. Bad stuff. Bad stuff. So he thought he's going to get away with it. The problem is, God knows everything. And there was a prophet who the Lord told what David was doing. The prophet, when gave him a chance to come clean, he didn't come clean. And the prophet said, Well, you're the man here. But I'm talking, you missed it. So then David, Psalm 51 comes out of that. Have mercy on me, God. Show me grace, God. And what does he say? He says, don't take your presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Why? I mean, he wrote songs, right? He's writing songs. and I mean, he, he's the one who would bring in the presence of God for the king before him. So he's aware of the presence of God. Yet when he missed it, he knew that that was a step out of the presence of God in his life. I don't know about you, but for me, of all the things that could be bad in my life that I wouldn't want to happen, that has to be number one on the list. Why? I don't want to live without an awareness of his presence in my life. Now, we've all sinned, we've all missed it, and God's made a way for us to come into his presence through the Lord Jesus Christ. But even as Christians, as believers, if you miss it, you know, you can almost sense like, whoo, I took a step away from like the presence of God in my life. What's pleasing to him. So I, I've missed it in a bad way. Well, I mean, David missed it in a bad way. I, just, I don't know anybody that hadn't missed it. But his prayer was, Lord, have mercy on me. Don't take your presence from me. I did cost David something, but he did recover. If David can recover from uh, adultery, murder, and cover up, I think, I think you can recover too. That's back in the Old Testament. Back in the Old Testament, they did crazy stuff, like stone people. 
Now, we ain't stoning anybody today, and the Lord hadn't told me any of your business just yet. (laughs) But I will tell you this. There is mercy for you if you have missed it. And if you want to enjoy life, the first step is choosing Jesus because he has the life that you and everyone on this planet is looking for. Second step is living life aware of his presence and saying, I'm just going to live life constantly aware of the presence of God in my life. Let it dictate the decisions that I make and the choices that I make and the places that I go and don't go because I want to live life that is pleasing to God, that is pleasing to his presence in my life. What happens when his presence is there? Fullness of joy. You know, there's times when we come together at church when, man, it just seems like the presence of God gets thicker. You know what I mean by thicker? It's just like, woo, man, and maybe they do hit the high note. (laughs) Maybe a few people do run around the church, get all excited. Well, it just seems like, man, we come together. It's what you call a corporate anointing. It's just like, man, the presence or the glory of God can get thick in a place. Amen. And just makes all of us aware that, hey, whoo, God is real. His presence is real. I want to live in his presence. Anybody else in here want to live aware of the presence of God? Come on, let's thank him for that today. Lord, I thank you for your presence today.